The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents No Neutrality, where we have a roundtable of contributors pushing the antithesis in every area of life. From family to government, apologetics to homeschooling, being a wife and a mother, a husband, a father, single, widow, business owner, or employee, you will hear commentary, essays, lectures, blogs, and battle plans on how to bring forth the Christian worldview to all of life. Lectures on the Politics of God and the Politics of Man, Lecture 12 Communism in the New Testament Christians usually look back to the early church of New Testament times as an example that the church should emulate in succeeding ages, even in the modern world of the 21st century. Indeed, it is sometimes argued that the best examples given us in Scripture should be drawn into rules for the Christian life. Consequently, the community of goods described in Acts chapters 2 to 5 has often been held up as an example that the church should follow. It has also been claimed, often with alarming social and political consequences, that this example should be taken as indicating how society should be organised politically. That is to say, it is sometimes taken not merely as an example of voluntary communism, which is in fact all that it was, but also as an example of how states should organise the economic life of society, by force if necessary. Perhaps the most notorious example of the outworking of this Christian communist ideology is the Anabaptist revolution that overtook Munster, the capital city of Westphalia in Germany, in 1534. Taking advantage of the struggle going on between Catholics and Lutherans, says Igor Shevarovich, and I quote, the Anabaptists gained control in the municipal council and then completely subjugated the town. All who refused to accept a second baptism were expelled after being stripped of all their possessions. Thereafter, all property in the city was appropriated for the common lot, everyone being obliged to deliver his possessions under the supervision of special deacons. Next, polygamy was introduced, and women of a certain age were forbidden to stay unmarried. Unquote. This was not an isolated example, however. There is a long tradition of violent, revolutionary Christian communism stretching from the heretics of the free spirit and the apostolic brethren in the 13th century through to the Taborites of the Hussite Wars in the 15th century, the heretical teachings of the Zwickau prophets and Thomas Munzer, the Anabaptist revolution itself in Munster in the 16th century, and on to the Marxist-Communist ideology of the modern liberation theology movements. According to the Mexican liberation theologian José Porfirio Miranda, and I quote, Jesus himself was a communist. Communism is obligatory for all Christians. The Ananias episode means pain of death for whoever betrays communism, Christianity's indispensable condition. No one can take the Bible seriously without concluding that according to it, the rich, for being rich, should be punished. Not to let them into the kingdom when the whole point is to establish the kingdom is clearly punishment. To commit them to torment, as the parable teaches, is punishment. To deprive them of all their goods and send them off with nothing is also punishment, for the simple crime of being rich. Unquote. In the last few pages of his book, Communism in the Bible, Miranda provides a defence of mob violence against private property based on John chapter 2, verse 15, in which Jesus is represented as the leader of a pogrom against the temple. Not surprisingly, therefore, Miranda describes Jesus as, and I quote, a hardened revolutionary, unquote. According to Miranda, and again I quote, The sacred authors know that all differentiating wealth is ill-gotten, that it has necessarily been obtained by despoiling and oppressing the rest of the population, and that therefore to be rich is to be unjust. They sigh for Yahweh to intervene and re-establish justice by despoiling the despoilers. For the sacred authors, the problem of evil is a social problem. Unquote.
The bizarre conclusion that Miranda comes to is that even God himself is obliged to support the communist revolution because it is his creative act that is responsible for the existence of the poor in the first place and the denial of their strict rights. Again I quote, To the extent that one does not participate in this communist revolutionary struggle, one participates in the benefits of a society which lives essentially by exploiting and oppressing the poor. Merely abstaining from the struggle constitutes complicity. The situation of the poor is injustice in the most strict and commutative sense of the word, in the sense that obliges restitution. Even God is under obligation in this matter, for it is God who set in motion the machinery of creation, which has resulted in tearing to bits the strict rights of the poor, who did not ask to come into the world in the first place. Unquote. Although Miranda's views are on the very extreme of the socialist ideological continuum, the basic principles that underpin his perspective and revolutionary conclusions are not essentially dissimilar to those espoused by more moderate Christian socialists. That is to say, many Christians have extrapolated from the practice of the Jerusalem church in the early chapters of the Book of Acts to the idea that the state should enforce communism or at least to the idea that scripture supports the organisation of society on a socialistic model. Of course, this begs the question of how we determine what the best examples in scripture are. There are plenty of bad examples in scripture that we are to learn from. They teach us to do the opposite. But there are also examples in scripture of good people doing very bad things, and we are to learn from these also. King David's example of adultery and murder is hardly to be imitated, though in other respects he is held up as a model of faith, and rightly so. We must be careful, therefore, about how we determine what examples in Scripture we are to follow. It may be argued, of course, that Scripture elsewhere condemns adultery and murder. Before following the example of those whose lives are described in Scripture, therefore, we must look carefully at what else the Bible says about these people and their actions. Likewise, we must look carefully at what else the Bible has to say about wealth, ownership of property, the family and social order, all of which have important bearings on the issue surrounding the community of goods in the Jerusalem church of Acts chapters 2 to 5, before we draw the conclusion that the latter is an example that we should follow. But there is one practice of the early church of the New Testament that the church throughout subsequent history has not followed. Nor has it ever been argued, to my knowledge, that the modern church should follow this practice. And yet it is no more directly condemned in Scripture than the community of goods in the Jerusalem church is directly condemned in Scripture. Nevertheless, the church has not considered this to be a good practice to follow, and with good reasons. The issue here is the funding of missions. The primitive church of the New Testament, the church in Jerusalem, became, within a few years of the inauguration of the Great Commission, financially dependent on her mission churches. That is to say, the churches of the Gentile world. See Acts chapters 24, 17, Romans chapter 15, verses 26 to 27, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 to 3. This was the reality of the New Testament situation. Are we right not to follow this example? Is the practice of the Jerusalem church a good example? Yes, we are right not to follow this example, because no, the practice of the Jerusalem church was not a good example. Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 14, and I quote, I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you, for the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children, unquote, may well be an indirect criticism of the Jerusalem church's experiment with the community of goods because of its consequences for the Gentile missions. And here lies a cautionary tale for those who would use the Church of Jerusalem as their model for the modern church and society at large, and indeed for all primitivist thinking about ecclesial and social theory. The Jerusalem church could not provide for herself economically. The community of believers at Jerusalem was too poor to survive when times were difficult without aid from the Gentile churches. And yet this was the church that practised the community of goods. Why was the church in Jerusalem so poor 
that Paul had to provide financial relief from the Gentile churches of Macedonia and Achaia, which did not practice communism. Throughout history, communistic communities of whatever nature, voluntary or state-enforced, have not been economically viable communities except under certain abnormal conditions. Where societies that practice a community of goods are economically viable, they are not usually family-based societies. In fact, the rejection of the biblical model of the family is usually to be found in such communities in some form. For example, monasteries are often economically viable communities, but they are not family-based communities. They are single-sex communities that require the rejection or suppression of a fundamental aspect of human nature. They are, therefore, abnormal societies. Furthermore, although they are often economically viable in the narrow sense, that is to say they produce enough to enable the community to live from year to year, and even a surplus beyond this that can be used to generate successful business enterprises, they are dependent upon the outside world for new members, since reproduction is denied as a means of securing the long-term future of the community. In other words, the continued existence of the community requires the existence of a world that does not share the ideals of the community, and indeed that lives in a way that contradicts the ideals of the community, from which it must recruit new members. If everyone were to adopt the ideals of monastic living, the community would not so much cease to be viable economically as cease altogether. In that sense, it is a sterile community that contradicts one of the most basic and fundamental purposes of God's creative will for mankind, the command to multiply. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. There are other economically viable communistic communities that do not share this ideology of sterility or infertility. The Hutterite Anabaptists, for example, whose ideals are derived from the Radical Reformation, live in societies that practice community of goods and that are economically viable, but retain marriage and procreation. Nevertheless, these societies do not usually practice normal family life. The family is communized as well as man's goods. Children are not brought up in family units, but by the whole community. In this sense, the ideal of the commune goes much further than the community of goods. The children are not really treated as the children of particular families, but as the children of the commune, and they are brought up in a way that is consistent with this belief. Normal family life is abandoned. In Hutterite society, says John A. Hostetler, and I quote, the function of the family is to produce new souls and to care for them until the colony takes over the major responsibility of training, that is to say educating, the children. The family performs those functions that cannot easily or efficiently be performed by the colony. Child rearing is not thought of as a private enterprise. Children are not extensions of the parents' egos but gifts of God who belong to the colony and potentially to the church. Unquote. This amounts to much more than the existence of a mere extended family. It is rather an ideology that structures the community. In communes that are economically viable, there is inevitably a price to be paid in this way. The social theory and practice of the commune is abnormal from the biblical point of view. That is to say, it involves the setting aside of the biblical pattern of family life, and this usually involves the denial of some aspect of man's created nature. The family does not function as a basic unit of society. Rather, the community takes over this function. The basic building block of normal society, the family, is either dispensed with altogether or restricted virtually to a mere biological function. The community replaces a family. In the more extreme medieval European heretical communistic sects, and also in the socialism of many Enlightenment philosophers and intellectuals, the communization of sexual relationships was also an article of faith. Another example of this is the communistic community established by the Oneida Perfectionists in Madison County, New York, between 1848 and 1880, under the leadership of John Humphrey Noyes. Although commercially successful as a communistic community, sexual communism and the abandonment of normal family life was a central doctrine of the community.
The family and communism are mutually exclusive social ideals. They cannot exist together for long. One must give way to the other. To say that it is God's purpose for mankind to have common ownership of property is to say, whether one realises it or not, that it is not God's purpose for mankind to live in families. To say that it is God's will for mankind to live in families is to say, wittingly or unwittingly, that it is not God's will for mankind to live in communist communities. The two cannot coexist in the same society without the one seeking to attack and destroy the other since they are conflicting social ideals, conflicting social orders that militate against each other. In societies practising a community of goods, whether voluntary or state-enforced, where the family does remain the basic unit of society, economic viability is compromised, although where there is a sudden change to communism from a previously highly capitalised non-communistic organisation of society, it may take considerable time, possibly even a generation or more, for this fact to become evident. Such communistic societies, whether voluntary or state-enforced, are not economically viable societies. This is why there were shortages of food and other basic necessities of life in Soviet Russia. It is also why the Church at Jerusalem ended up in the situation in which she could not provide for her own members. History has shown this to be the case time and again, and it would seem that it is this same lesson that the Bible teaches with regard to the Jerusalem church when all the biblical evidence is considered. The Christian community in Jerusalem had become unable to support itself economically and needed help from the Gentile church. Therefore, Paul had to take collections from the Gentile churches which did not practice the community of goods, as described in Acts chapters 4 and 5, to help the poverty-stricken church at Jerusalem. It has been claimed that the poverty of the Jerusalem church was occasioned by a famine that particularly affected Jerusalem and the surrounding country. This famine is believed by many to have been the one predicted by the prophet Agabus in Acts chapter 11 verses 27 to 30. However, what Agabus predicted was a famine throughout the world, not a local famine, and by the time Paul had taken aid from the churches of Macedonia and Achaia to Jerusalem, many parts of the Roman Empire had experienced famine, though not all at the same time. Paul himself bears witness to the extreme poverty of the churches in Macedonia. Yet these churches still sent aid to the Jerusalem church. See 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 1 to 4. Poverty was not the exclusive experience of Christians in the church of Jerusalem. What was the exclusive experience of Christians in the Church of Jerusalem was the community of goods, which made them so ill-equipped to deal with their poverty that other poor believers from the Gentile churches had to provide them with financial aid. How are we to understand the community of goods practised by the Church in Jerusalem in the light of what the Bible has to say about this practice and what it has to say about other issues bearing upon it? First, the community of goods practised by the church at Jerusalem is nowhere in scripture commanded nor even commended. In fact, the practice of the Jerusalem church is not even commended in the book of Acts. It is merely described. What then, it may be asked, does the story of Ananias and Sapphira, who failed to enter into the spirit of this experiment and were struck dead for their sin, teach us? See Acts chapter 5 verses 1 to 11. Well, it teaches us precisely that they were under no obligation to participate in the community of goods and that failure to do so brought no disapprobation. This is clear from Peter's rebuke of Ananias. Quote, but Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart, that thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God? Unquote. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 to 4. Sapphira's offence was that she was complicit with her husband in this lie. Acts chapter 5, verses 7 to 10. Their sin was lying to the Holy Spirit about what they had given to the community, not their holding back part of the proceeds of the sale of the land. 
Peter acknowledged that the property was their own, that they had the freedom to dispose of it according to their own will, and that they were under no obligation to give the land or the proceeds of its sale to the community. Scripture makes no further direct comment on this incident, nor on the experiment in the community of goods as practised in Jerusalem, nor does it give any further direct teaching on this issue other than what can be deduced from the condition of poverty into which the church subsequently fell, evidenced by the need of the Gentile churches to support the community of believers in Jerusalem financially. Nowhere in the Bible is the community of goods advocated as a social theory or an advisable way to live. Second, however, the teachings of the Bible on the use of wealth and the kind of economic system advocated in the Bible are incompatible with the community of goods. For example, the Bible teaches that, and I quote, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, unquote, Proverbs 13, verse 22. Leaving an inheritance to one's children and grandchildren is a godly ideal in Scripture. The expropriation of a man's inheritance is condemned in Scripture. See 1 Kings chapter 21. The inheritance of the Israelites was jealously guarded by the laws of the Torah. The social and economic system of ancient Israel, as laid down in the law of Moses, was aimed at protecting the inheritance of the Israelites and ensuring that a family's inheritance could not be permanently alienated either by force or choice. Furthermore, the Eighth Commandment and the command not to move the boundary mark of another man's land, Deuteronomy 19.14, 27.17, Proverbs 22.28 and 23.10 following, are meaningless in a communistic society. The Jubilee was instituted precisely to ensure that the people were not permanently dispossessed of their inheritance. Inheritance is a significant theme in the history of Israel and an important concept in scripture, both economically and eschatologically. Such an economic and social order is not compatible with the ideal of communism. Third, the community of goods practised in the Jerusalem church runs contrary to the principle taught by the Apostle Paul to Gentile believers, namely that they should work to provide for their own needs and produce a surplus, that's to say a profit, to use the economic term, so that they would be able to help those in need. See, for example, Acts chapter 20, verses 33 to 34, Ephesians 4, verse 28, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 11 to 12, and 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 8 to 12, taken together. The community of believers in the Jerusalem church was not able to provide for its own members, let alone provide help for others, and this is why Paul had to secure financial help from the Gentile churches. Does all this mean that the experiment in the community of goods in Jerusalem was sinful? It may be difficult to maintain such an argument without some qualification, but it is clear, first, that for those participating in it, such an experiment could only be entered into voluntarily, and second, that one would need to ensure that such a lifestyle did not lead to the disinheriting of legitimate heirs. See Deuteronomy chapter 21 verses 15 to 17 and Proverbs chapter 13 verse 22. Or to the neglect of one's duty to provide for one's dependence. See 1 Timothy 5 verses 8 to 16. Failure to abide by these two principles would have involved participating members of the Jerusalem Church's experiment with communism in sin. It is clear from the case of Ananias and Sapphira that communism was not mandatory for individual believers in the Jerusalem Church, even though it appears to have been practised by the community as a whole. Third, subsequent teaching by the Apostle Paul makes it clear that the Jerusalem church did fall short of the Christian ideal with regard to the provision of welfare. Quote, But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. If any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. 
If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Unquote. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 4, 8 and 16. The communism of the Jerusalem church produced a lifestyle that Paul here condemns in no uncertain terms as worse than that of non-believers and a practical denial of the faith. That is to say, as an ongoing situation in which neither the participating believers nor the church as a whole could provide for their own dependence. Surely, if the community of goods practised by the Jerusalem church is God's will for his church, and indeed for society as a whole, we may ask why the Apostle Paul never teaches this himself in his epistles, nor requires its practice in the Gentile churches he founded. He does not even so much as hint at such an arrangement. Indeed, he teaches the precise opposite, namely, that believers should provide for their own dependence, and that church welfare should be available only when the family is not able to provide. It is as if the Jerusalem church's experiment with communism was an embarrassing failure that is not spoken about, but rather avoided. It may even conceivably have been the failure of the Jerusalem church's experiment with communism that prompted Paul to give these strongly worded instructions to Timothy. In the light of this subsequent apostolic teaching, therefore, it is questionable whether such an experiment in communism as that undertaken by the Jerusalem church could now be repeated without sin, that is to say, without the flagrant disregard of subsequent apostolic teaching, which, Scripture tells us, is part of the foundation of the church and of the life of faith. See Ephesians chapter 2 verses 19 to 20. At the very least, we can say that even in the best scenario, that is to say, where no sin is involved, such a way of living is not advisable in the light of biblical teaching. The community of goods is not a biblical ideal. The Jerusalem commune failed miserably to live up to the ideals given us in Scripture about the use of wealth and charitable provision for those in need. Charity necessitates the production of a surplus, that is to say a profit, Subsistence living is incompatible with the ideal of charitable aid to the poor because such aid requires the accumulation of wealth that can be transferred to those in need. But the Jerusalem church did not last very long before the community of goods failed even to produce enough to meet the needs of her own members. Instead of providing for their mission in the Gentile world, the Christians in Jerusalem became dependent upon their mission churches financially. Although the Bible does not explicitly condemn the Jerusalem church's experiment with voluntary communism as sinful per se, therefore, it seems clear from what scripture says elsewhere about the use of wealth and the organisation of society economically that it was a mistake that produced long-term adverse consequences for the Jerusalem church and her mission churches in the Gentile world which had to support the believers in Jerusalem financially. And although it cannot be argued directly from Scripture, this may well have weakened the Jerusalem church's ability to function as an example to the growing church throughout the Roman Empire and beyond, thereby weakening the moral and spiritual authority of the church at Jerusalem. Already within the time span covered by the book of Acts, Antioch takes on a much more important role as a centre of missionary activity than Jerusalem, which quickly seems to lose authority and credibility as the geographical centre of the Christian faith. If this is the case, it may well be asked how the church over which the apostles presided could have made such a significant mistake. But of course this was not the only mistake made by the early church and the apostles that the Bible records for our instruction. The apostolic church was not infallible, nor were the apostles infallible. There are two other incidents that illustrate the fallibility of the apostles and caution us against treating their actions as examples to be followed and drawn into rules for the Christian life without further confirmation from the broader teaching of Scripture. First, Acts chapter 2 verses 12 to 26 records the decision of the church following the ascension to fill the apostolic ministry left vacant by Judas Iscariot thereby bringing the number of the apostles back up to twelve. The criterion that the apostles laid down as being essential for anyone 
who was to fulfil the role of an apostle, was that he should have been a fellow companion with themselves and Jesus from the beginning. They therefore chose two men who fulfilled this criterion and selected one of them, Matthias, by casting lots. This whole process of choosing another apostle to replace Judas was carried out in direct disobedience to the explicit command of the Lord Jesus Christ himself that the apostles should remain in Jerusalem and wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 4 following. Instead of waiting for the outpouring of the Spirit, whom Christ had promised would lead them into all truth, John chapter 16 13, Peter decided to set himself up effectively as the Archbishop of the whole church and establish the first code of ecclesiastical law to govern the future ministry of the church. But this led to a problem, because God then chose Saul of Tarsus to be his apostle to the Gentiles, a man who not only had not been with the apostles and Jesus from the beginning, but who had been a fierce persecutor of the church up to the point of his conversion to the faith. Furthermore, he was sent out as an apostle from Antioch, not Jerusalem, and the apostles in Jerusalem had no part in his being chosen or ordained as an apostle to the Gentiles. After his first mission to the Gentile world, therefore, Paul had to defend his apostleship before the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. When Paul appeared before the apostles and reported to them all that had taken place in his mission to the Gentiles, the apostles accepted Paul and Barnabas into the company of the apostles. In doing so, they overturned their previous criterion for accepting anyone into the company of the apostles. The criterion initially used to determine suitability for apostleship by the apostles themselves was clearly erroneous, and the recognition that this rule was worthless was only brought about when the issue was forced upon the apostles by subsequent events. Indeed, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul attacks the very principle on which the apostles' original ruling was based, that is to say, knowledge of Christ according to the flesh, which for Paul had no bearing whatsoever on apostolic authority. With the conversion of Paul and his calling to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, it became clear that the man-made and self-serving rules laid down by Peter and the apostles in Jerusalem were detrimental to the mission of the church and that the spread of the gospel could not be dependent on the authority, direction and example of the Jerusalem church. Centralised international control of the church by clergymen and ecclesiastical lawmaking had no part in God's plan for the apostolic age. And if the apostles themselves could not be trusted with such power, much less are the lesser men of the papacy and large centralised denominations to be trusted with it. The divine calling of Paul took no account whatsoever of the ecclesiastical law laid down by Peter and the other apostles for ordaining their successors. It was as if God had thumbed his nose at the apostles' vain attempts to control the future of the church's ministry by means of ecclesiastical laws and regulations and the ordaining of clergymen. The concept of apostolic succession was, therefore, discredited at its very inception by the divine calling and ministry of Paul, which represented its complete antithesis. Second, when the Apostle Peter visited Antioch, he at first joined in fellowship with the Gentiles, who had been accepted into the church without having to convert to Judaism. The acceptance of the Gentiles in this way was a principle that Peter believed and practised as a result of being shown by the Lord Jesus in a revelation that the Gentiles were to be accepted into the church without having to be circumcised first. But later, when certain Judaizers who had come from James arrived in Antioch, Peter, fearing the party of those who insisted that Gentile believers should be circumcised, stopped mixing with the Gentiles and stood aloof from them with the result that the rest of the Jews joined him and even Barnabas was led astray by Peter's hypocrisy. See Galatians chapter 2 verses 11 to 21. Paul therefore opposed Peter and rebuked him for his hypocrisy and the bad example that he had set. It is clear from these incidents that the apostolic church was not infallible, that the apostles were not infallible, that they made mistakes and committed sins, and that the scriptures, which are the inspired and infallible word of God, recorded these errors for our instruction. 
that is to say, so that we might understand what happened and learn from the mistakes of the early church. Despite the clear testimony of scripture regarding these matters, it is common to find theologians arguing to the contrary on the presumed authority of scripture, that is to say, claiming scriptural authority for dogmatic statements that contradict scripture. According to Charles Hodge, for example, and I quote, the apostles were inspired and as religious teachers infallible, unquote. Similarly, Edward J. Carnell tells us that, and again I quote, the marks of an apostle were to be with Jesus from the beginning and to be appointed by Jesus and to perform signs and wonders, unquote. According to Carnell, and again I quote, Orthodoxy is that branch of Christendom which limits the ground of religious authority to the Bible. Unquote. On this basis, Carnell's own statement about the marks of apostleship is unorthodox. Peter claimed that a mark of an apostle was to have been with Jesus from the beginning. Subsequent events proved him and all those who follow him in this claim to be wrong. These events are recorded in Scripture for our instruction. Furthermore, at one point even the Apostle Paul himself, in his first epistle to the Corinthians, warns his readers that what he has to say on a particular question about which he had been asked for guidance is his own opinion and not to be considered the infallible word of God. See 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 6, 12 and 25. It is of course true that orthodoxy limits the ultimate ground of religious authority to the scriptures, but it limits it to the scriptures as a whole, not to texts taken out of context or interpreted contrary to the genre of the literature in which they are found or contrary to reason, though of course what is to be considered reasonable must also be determined in subjection to the teachings of scripture. In other words, scripture must be allowed to interpret itself. Quote, the infallible rule of interpretation of scripture is scripture itself and therefore when there is a question about the true and full sense of any scripture which is not manifold but one it must be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly Unquote. Westminster Confession of Faith chapter 1 section 9 To read the Bible in any other way is to reduce it to a mere collection of unrelated proof texts at best, and therefore unorthodox and unfaithful to scripture as a whole. In neither of the incidents discussed here can the initial actions of the apostles be held up as examples to be followed, let alone drawn into rules for the church to follow in all ages. In just the same way, the community of goods practised by the Apostolic Church in Jerusalem is not an ideal to be followed. As with the criterion for apostleship and Peter's hypocrisy in Antioch, subsequent events and the wider teaching of Scripture must be taken into account when assessing the meaning and value of the Jerusalem Church's experiment with communism. These events are recorded in Scripture to teach us something. Of that there can be no doubt. But it is not that the community of goods is an ideal to follow. Rather, it is that the community of goods is an example that we should not follow and that such practices end in the economic and social impoverishment of the communities that adopt them. What is held up in the Bible as the ideal of a just economic system is incompatible with the community of goods. That is to say, private ownership of property, private stewardship of the economic resources of society and the inviolability of legitimate inheritance. The communistic model is nowhere repeated in the Bible, nor is it held up as an example to be followed. If it were a good example to be followed, we should expect it to be referred to in other passages where the Bible gives teaching on wealth, work and helping others. But there are no such references Paul does not refer to it in giving advice to the Thessalonians. See 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 8 to 12 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 8 to 12. Or to the Ephesians, see Ephesians 4 verse 28, where we would expect it if it were good advice and where helping the poor is commended. 
something that is only possible if we produce wealth in greater abundance than we consume it. On the contrary, in these scriptures Paul gives alternative advice that is incompatible with the community of goods. Neither does he refer to it when writing to the Corinthians regarding the support of his own ministry while among them. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 7 to 9. In this respect, it is significant that the great model of welfare provision for the needy was pioneered by the Gentile churches of the Roman Empire and was one of the great testimonies to the Christian faith in the ancient world. This led the apostate emperor Julian to comment that, and I quote, The impious Galileans support not only their own poor but ours as well, unquote. But this was not the practice of the Jerusalem church, which was a recipient of welfare, not a provider. What this experiment in the community of goods in the Jerusalem church clearly demonstrates, therefore, is that if communism did not work in the New Testament church under the guidance of the apostles of Christ, it has little chance of working anywhere. The end product of communism is universal poverty, and this was just as much the case with the New Testament church as with any other society that has practised it. The only exception to this general rule, historically, are communities that have abolished the Christian ideal of family life and either denied procreation altogether or separated it from the normal family context of raising children. In other words, marriage and procreation are practised, but the family unit is replaced by the broader community. However, the Bible does show us that the church is to be a real society, that is to say, a social order that functions effectively as a model for the nations. The goal of apostolic labour in the New Testament period is the Christian community, which stands in Christ as a work of God's redemptive power manifested in history. This work of God's power is not a commune, but it is a community, a social order that should grow and increase until it displaces and ultimately supplants the godless society of non-belief that surrounds it. This is our calling in the Great Commission to disciple the nations. The Jerusalem church was a failure in this respect. There is nothing about the economically debilitated condition of the church in Jerusalem that commends itself as an example to the world. The example, rather, is the practice of the Gentile church, which did not follow the ideal of communism and was able to provide financial assistance to those in need. Both the mission and the influence of the Gentile church were therefore much greater than the mission and influence of the Jerusalem church. We must not confuse the ideal of the commune with the ideal of the church living as a real society, a social order, that functions across the whole spectrum of human life. When the church functions as a true society, a manifestation of the kingdom of God as a social order, meeting the needs of human society in a Christian way of life, she provides light to the world. This, of course, involves helping and caring for each other and for those in need. But the Jerusalem church fell at this very point, as do all communistic societies with the exception of those that reject the family as the basic unit of society. Helping those in need is an important part of living as the church, but in order to do this we need to provide an example to the world of how society should function. This necessitates the rejection of the social ideal of the commune and the adoption of the Christian community as our social ideal, that is to say, a true society with its own social order founded on faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and obedience to his law. End of lecture 12。Thank you for listening to this episode of No Neutrality on the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network. Don't forget to visit reconstructionistradio.com to download your favorite audiobooks and podcasts. And if you are a Christian Reconstructionist blogger and you'd like to contribute your blogs into this audio blog format, click on the volunteer link on our website, send us an email, and let us know you'd like to join the team. May Christ be glorified and his kingdom extended from sea to sea and from the rivers to the ends of the earth.
the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.